Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, and if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby, and welcome. Today's case is one that is very dear to my heart. It's one that I've put a lot of work into. I first heard about it probably six months ago, started researching into it about five months ago, and it's been kind of a roller coaster ride. There were a few bumps in the road when it came to this case, but I'm excited to finally be getting to it. I am talking about the disappearance of a mother and daughter. The mother's name is Leela Lewis. It does look like her name may be pronounced Layla, but it is Leela. I was informed by the family and her daughter, Mary Rachel Bryan. This is one of those cases that you can't help but before bed lay there and think of all the ways this case could have panned out and all the things that could have happened to this mother and daughter and i also have to give a big thank you to one of leela and mary's family members that really helped me a complete sweetheart that i hope i will do justice for this video and that they approve of my video because they helped me so much so with all that being said let's get into the video This is the strange disappearance of Leela Lewis and Mary Rachel Bryan. Leela Lewis was born on September 6th, 1904 in Bladenboro, North Carolina in Bladen County. According to Ancestry, she had 13 siblings and in 1923, she graduated from Bladenboro High School and then went on to become a nurse training at James Walker Memorial Hospital in Wilmington, North Carolina. The hospital where she was a nurse at, she met Eddie or E.C. Bryan. He supposedly came in because of a gunshot wound to the leg that he received from the husband of a woman he was seeing at the time, or at least that's how the story goes. Despite his reason for being there at the hospital that day and the reason they ended up meeting, they fell in love very quickly and married in June of 1931. A few years later, they welcomed a beautiful baby girl named Mary Rachel Bryan. Then Leela quit nursing and started working at Atlantic Seaboard Coastline Railroad in Wilmington, North Carolina. They lived in the coastal town of Carolina Beach in a cute little beach house not far from the water. The day of Saturday, May 10th, 1941 seemed like any other day, but it wasn't. It was the day that Leela, who was 36 years old, and her only daughter, Mary, who was four years old, would never be seen from or heard from again. At around 6.30 p.m., Leela was preparing dinner in the kitchen for her family while her husband was out pouring concrete forms for preparation for pouring cement later on. They ate dinner and the night went on. It was said that Leela was supposed to be visiting her family in Bladenboro the next day because the next day was Mother's Day. Around 9 p.m., Leela told her husband she was going to head to the Five and Dime store, located about two blocks away, to pick up a new bra and then possibly go to the grocery store after. She was originally planning to go alone, but Mary begged to go with her because she loved car rides and of course being with her mother, so Leela brought her along. No one is entirely sure the exact amount of money that Leela had on her when she left the home, but we do know that she did make sure to bring $2 to get a bra. I looked up the price of bras back then and they were roughly around $1.50. They left an EC's 1935 black A Ford coupe with the license plate number 219056. They did not have much gas in the tank at the time, but that didn't bother Leela because they weren't going too far. After that, E.C. fell asleep either on the couch or the recliner. Somewhere in the living room, he kind of dozed off. And then a little bit of time later, Leela's brother, Barry Lewis, stopped by the house. Barry was a sheriff's deputy in Bladen County, which was Leela's hometown, about an hour and a half away. He came in town for a dance, and since he was in town, he was going to offer Leela a ride back home after, since she was planning to visit the next day anyway. When he arrived at the home a little bit after 9, he was told by E.C. that his sister and his niece was not home. Barry went to the dance, came back to the house around 10 o'clock to see if his sister and his niece were back home. They weren't, so he decided to go looking for them. The Five and Dime store was located on the boardwalk. He looked around for them, for their car, and couldn't locate them anywhere. He searched surrounding areas, and they were still nowhere to be found. He went back to the house and told E.C. that he couldn't find them anywhere, 
and they waited until about 12 a.m. and Leela and Mary were still not home yet, so this is when they decided to phone police and tell them that they were missing. A search began the next day and on May 12th, New Hanover Sheriff's Department began helping and they organized a team to scour the beach and wooded area between their house and the boardwalk. A private plane was also used in the search to search back roads and rivers, but they found nothing. You have to think that they were not only looking for a mother and daughter, an adult and a small child, they were looking for an entire vehicle. And this is what they were mostly searching for because if they found the vehicle, they would probably find them. On June 14th, the North Carolina Bureau of Investigation was called in and they sent two agents to investigate. On June 23rd, the Borough of Investigation telegraphs the War Department to send over 200 soldiers to help in the search. On June 28th, the Wilmington newspaper sends out a request to Florida newspapers and radio stations to be on the lookout for a mother and her daughter because some people in Florida claimed they saw them. The next year, in June of 1942, an electric submersible detector was used in the search inlet and waterways near the home for any clues. All of this and still nothing. There were a ton of supposed sightings, though, all along the East Coast, all the way from New York down to Florida. A majority of these sightings, though, were in Florida, but none of them really went anywhere. They could not find that vehicle anywhere. Still, to this day, it is like the Earth just opened up and swallowed them. They completely vanished. There was one newspaper article that stated Leela stopped at the gas station and bought 13 gallons of gas. This was only one article though and it was never brought up again from any other sources. The search went on and on and like in many cases, whether it's a disappearance or a murder case, when it comes to somebody who is married, a lot of the time you look at the spouse. Maybe they had a rocky marriage, maybe it was an abusive marriage. When it came to EC, there were no reports I could find of him possibly being an abusive husband or father. If he was, then possibly Leela up and left with her daughter, but even if she did, she was close to her family and the chances of her never speaking to them again is very slim. I'm not saying he wasn't, but it's unknown. Her mother didn't like him though, only really because he had been previously married and was divorced, which was insanely frowned upon back then. So he did offer a $100 reward to anyone who came forward with any information that may lead to the discovery of his wife and daughter. Now $100 doesn't seem like a lot, but in 1941 it was about $1,600 in today's time. Some people think that maybe because she couldn't get a divorce, because family and friends and society back then would have looked down upon it so much, maybe she thought that leaving was her only option. If she was going to leave though, she would have also needed as much money as possible, but she even left her jewelry at home. Jewelry she took off and laid next to the sink while she was cooking. If she wanted to skip town, she would probably have taken those to sell. Then again, according to EC, which you have to take what EC said with a grain of salt because EC's story is pretty much the only one we have to go off of when it comes to what happened the night that she disappeared, it was said that Leela was planning on going to the store by herself and that Mary begged to go with her. So if Leela was planning on 100% just leaving and skipping town, wouldn't she have made sure her daughter went with her that night? Unless this entire story is a lie and EC definitely did have something to do with their disappearance. But then again, you have to think what happened to the car. If he was going to get rid of his wife and his daughter, why would he involve the car? Unless there was some sort of fight or argument and he got physical in the car and very violent and attacked her in some way and there was some sort of evidence in the car like blood and then he decided to get rid of the car as well. It just goes in 50,000 different directions. Now I'm sure many of you are also thinking how weird it is that she decided to go at 9pm to go get a bra. Most stores close around that time. Yes, she did live close, but why did she want to go so late? This factor is brought up in today's time, but no police or newspapers brought this up back then as being strange. So maybe stores on the boardwalk stayed open a bit later. So many things in this case just don't add up, but in 1948, both Leela and her daughter Mary were officially pronounced dead, even though they never found their remains. In the year 1949, an inmate in Florida named Daniel Webster confessed to the crime, but he later recanted his confession saying he only said it so they could arrest him and take him back to North Carolina and he could serve his time in prison there where he was from. Then, seven years later, there were skeletal remains of a woman and a child found and 
Basically the entire town, the family, everybody was patiently waiting to see if these remains did belong to Leela and Mary. The remains were found by a zookeeper. It gave people hope that possibly the mystery would be solved, but after examination, they were not the remains of Leela and Mary. An article in North Carolina was released that stated that a man named Carl Ponzer, an engineer from the Army Corps of Engineers, was supervising work on sewer lines in 1941 when he walked up on two people burying two other people. Then, coincidentally, Carl died less than a year later from an accidental gunshot. That was ruled a suicide. His son believes it was not a suicide, and whoever was burying the woman and child killed his father so he could never tell the police the location of where he saw this happen. Personally, to me, what really sticks out with this case is Carl Ponzer's story about how he saw two men burying a woman and a small child not long after Leela and Mary disappeared. This is just too coincidental in my opinion. If he actually was telling the truth, and that is something that he saw, which I really want to believe that he was telling the truth, there's a big possibility that that was Leela and her daughter being buried by two men. When you think about it, what are the chances that another woman and child went missing right after Leela and Mary went missing right in that exact area? Carl died before ever getting to tell police the exact location where this happened, so police have never been able to search the area at all. When it comes to this case though, many people do lean towards EC being responsible, even though there's really no evidence of him being a bad husband or a bad father. One of the people that thinks that EC's story is a little bit fishy is Leela's nephew. He asked me to not put his name in this video, so I will not be doing that out of respect for him. But he tried very, very hard and is still trying to this day to find out what happened to his aunt and his cousin. In November of 2008, the current homeowners of the Bryan's home let crew search under the floor using deep penetrating radar. They found strange anomalies under the surface. In 2009, they began to dig. All they found in the end, though, were animal bones, possibly from a deer and glass. According to her nephew, they were not looking in the right places with the ground penetrating radar. Her nephew's heart just sank when they hit another dead end. He was sure that they were going to find something, and like he said, it's almost like they evaporated from Earth. I also have to mention that a story called The Incredible Disappearance was published in True Detective, a magazine I've mentioned multiple times before on my channel, in the 1950s all about the case. Some information is incorrect, like that a pharmacist claimed Leela had come in to buy bichloride of mercury before she disappeared. This is the only place that this was ever mentioned. After this came out, some people believed that maybe she did buy bichloride of mercury to try to take her own life, but you do have to remember that she did used to be a nurse, and she would have known that taking a large amount of bichloride of mercury would result in a very long and painful death and no matter the mental state she was in many people just don't think that this is something she would have done but even if she did decide to take her own life whether it be by chloride of mercury or some other horrible tragic way what happened to mary it's not impossible but the chances of her also taking mary's life in the process are just very 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 slim so possibly she took her own life and then put her in someone else's care, but why would she do that? Wouldn't she have just skipped town with her and start a new life so she could be with her daughter? Of course she wouldn't have wanted to leave her family and never speak to them again, but this was 1941, this was a completely different time, and divorce was extremely, extremely frowned upon, and maybe she felt like this was her only way out, maybe she felt like she didn't have another option, because if she did go to family or friends back then, there is a pretty much 95% chance that any of them would have told her to just suck it up and stay with him. That's just how it was back then. All we really have in this case, even 78 years later, is a bunch of theories. The biggest question is how on earth could their car just vanish as well? They searched lakes and ponds and never found an entire car. 
but a windshield did end up washing up onto land at one point, but they were unable to tell if it was 100% from EC's vehicle Leela used the night she left. Like I stated before, a large percentage of people leaned towards her husband possibly being responsible. He was ruled out as a suspect though pretty quickly because there was no evidence. Some leaned towards her possibly driving her car into a body of water. There was a place called Snow's Cut, which was a waterway directly into the ocean that they primarily searched but never found anything. It just honestly does not look like they ever made it to the boardwalk. So if their intentions were to make it to the boardwalk, to go to the Five and Dime store, they somehow disappeared within the two blocks to the boardwalk because it was a Saturday night, somebody would have seen them. I think one thing that is so confusing is that they were going such a short distance away from their home. They asked people at the stores she was supposed to be going to that night, like the Five and Dime store and the grocery store, and no one working there the night that she was supposed to go there had seen Leela or Mary that night. When it comes to what happened before they left the home that night, all we really have to go off of is her husband's story, one that does seem a little bit fishy. According to him, Leela left the home with her hair wrapped up in a green turban, a summer print dress, brown and white shoes, and no stockings. Some find the no stockings factor a tad strange as well because back then, women were taught to always look their best. Some women wouldn't even work around the house without getting made up a little bit first. Not a huge factor, just a little one that I had to mention. One interesting theory though that I do have to also bring up and one that her great great grand niece agreed was a good one was that possibly Leela was in an abusive relationship and she saw how her husband was working on cement molds and became terrified. He had plans to dispose of her body in some way so she up and left. That is a possibility. I have a lot of thoughts when it comes to this case and after going over probably 20 to 30 different theories. I have pretty much narrowed it down to a few that I think are very possible. Of course, the first is that possibly EC was responsible, which of course you have to think, what did he do with the car? But I mean, maybe he took it apart because there was some sort of evidence on it, like I stated before. Maybe he did dispose of it in a lake or a pond somewhere or a lake or a pond farther away that police did not get to search. But even if he was an abusive husband and did something to his wife, it is strange that he would have also done something to his daughter if he was angry at his wife in some way. I mean, you have to be pretty evil to take your wife and child's life, but I don't know, the world can be an evil place at times. The next is that Leela did skip town, but of course you have to think back that when Leela was leaving, according to EC, Leela was going to go by herself and Mary begged her to go, so this doesn't really make much sense. Leela's mother did look down on divorce, so maybe she figured that she would just skip town and never return and never talk to her family again, so they couldn't look down on her for that decision. There were all those supposed sightings where people claimed to have seen Leela and her daughter Mary all the way from New York down to Florida, but the car was low on gas and there was only one sighting of her supposedly at a gas station getting gas and it was only about 13 gallons. So when that 13 gallons was up, they would need to refill somewhere else and there were no other sightings anywhere at a gas station. That is one way it could have happened and that's the one thing I hope, even though I don't think that's what happened, I hope that's what happened, that Leela and Mary just left and lived out their life and that maybe Mary is still alive to this day. The next is that her intention was to actually go to the boardwalk and go to the five and dime store and then the grocery store and that somewhere between the distance of her house to the boardwalk, something happened. This is a very, very short distance. It's about a five minute distance from the house to the boardwalk and I'm talking walking distance. So the chances of something happening are very slim, but it's not impossible. I highly doubt that something happened from walking from the front door to the car because her husband would have heard something or neighbors would have heard her scream in some way. I doubt that something happened while she was driving in the vehicle because it's such a short distance. So in my head, the way that I decipher the situation, something had to have happened from getting out of the car 
to the store. It was a Saturday night, so the boardwalk would have been pretty crowded, so maybe she couldn't find a parking spot close by. Maybe she parked down the street to walk over, and maybe somebody saw that she was alone with her daughter and there weren't many people around where she parked and took this opportunity to abduct her or hold her at gunpoint and get in the car and drive off with her, which they would have obviously had to get in the vehicle and drive off with it, with Leela and Mary because they never found the vehicle, they never found the car. It's just, this case baffles me. If you do want to learn more about this case, which I suggest it because it is a rabbit hole you will get sucked down into, I will leave all my sources down in the description. Go check it out. And also leave some love down in the comments because some of the family members will be watching this video and I want them to see some amazing comments and I want them to see that there are people who still care about this case and want to learn more. And also, as always, leave any theories you have down below in the comments because I love reading through them and even as the researcher of these cases, you guys come up with stuff that blows my mind that I never even thought about and maybe the families never thought about either. That's it for today's case and if there are any updates I will let you guys know and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye guys!